Hello, uh, and uh, thanks for coming um, to my presentation. Uh, thank you, Maggie, for inviting me. And indeed, the presentation is called uh, What Have I Learned in Nine Years of Documenting Second Life? Um, now, uh, I'm going to uh, speak, and uh, we're going to watch um, a few films that I made over the years. Uh, First, real quick, thank you, Marianne McCann, who is in the audience, uh, who is incredibly helpful also um, with the with the video series that we're doing now, the Drugs Drugs Files World Maker series. <clears throat> but uh, really briefly, uh, my background, um, and you can cut me off if you if you're tired of that story. I'll try to keep it uh, keep it short and sweet. And I tell this story so many times that. I feel I get actually more entertaining um, as a force to as opposed to more boring but uh, essentially uh, my name in in second life is Draxter Dupre and I came in uh, February 2007 um, and pretty much Im uh, immediately it occurred to me that the role that I want to have in this world is to is sort of a documentarian of sorts um, so you know as you know you can be anything you want uh, and um, and as opposed to for example pursuing music uh, I'm a musician in real life um, you know I I didn't want to do that uh, I do have a background in radio journalism also so what I did was when I discovered that you can capture the screen and that that is called machinima which I had no idea what that was um, I could actually apply some of those skills from the radio uh, for these uh, little reportages and just add the machinima to it and um, and so I did that um, I did that two or three weeks after I came in I mean it's it's when I look back it's unbelievable but there was a certain obsession with with trying to understand this absolutely fascinating place and the first very first story that I did um, has kind of uh, the format a little bit um, that we're doing now what I'm doing now as you may know for the last two and a half years is a series called the Drax Files World Maker series and that series basically profiles individuals um, sometimes groups and they are from across the spectrum they can be educators they can be entrepreneurs they can be um, artists um, I did a story a little bit behind the scenes at Linden Lab um, and what's interesting is that uh, some people have no idea that I started in a very humble fashion and I would like us to watch this uh, film now the first film that I did which is about democracy in second life and um, it profiles the Neufreistadt community the Confederation of Democratic Simulators and that of course coincided at the time with uh, the, the the primary season and 2007 so let's watch this uh, there is a screen behind us you can click it and it should play back that very very first machinima that I ever made and like I said again I had no idea what machinima was I just knew I could capture the screen and I could edit that um, in the background um, with traditional sort of editing tools I'm, I'm typing the the uh, URL for the film uh, also in the local chat and let's watch this is three and a half minutes and then just let me know when you're uh, when you when you're done ask yourself this question when have I last voted in any election have I engaged in my duty as a citizen of my country in a meaningful way and who gets elected if I do not participate in the 2000 presidential elections in the United States, for example, only 51% of the voting age population took the time to punch a hole in a card. Current Commander-in-Chief President Bush has very little support, but have all those Bush haters really exercised their basic democratic right? 
In contrast, the virtual cities of always foggy Neufreistadt and Roman-themed Colonia Nova have elected their representatives at a rate of almost 65%. The two Sims belong to the Confederation of Democratic Simulators, or CDS. Michelle Manin is member of the CARE Party and the nonprofit organization Credo. Recently, he was elected to the Representative Assembly, which meets every other Sunday evening at the Neufreistadt Rathaus. I found CDS to be the only truly democratic community in Second Life. We have a written constitution and currently four political parties, one of them center-right, one of them center-left, and two specifically created for the Second Life environment. As secretive governments become commonplace in real life, the city's Neufreistadt and Colonia Nova keep institutions transparent and public. In Second Life, estate managers are also owners of the land and therefore can act really like a monarch. What happens in the Confederation of Democratic Simulators is that the manager is appointed by the representative assembly, elected directly by the people, and the estate manager will do exactly what the representative assembly tells him or her to do. This openness has benefited the cultural sector. The Museum of Contemporary Art, or MOCA, in Neufreistadt has just hosted a grand opening, attended by SL celebrities Gwyneth Llewellyn and artist Dave Edinburgh, among many others. Delia Lake is the curator of the museum. The vacant MOCA irritated her for months before she decided it would be her role to take the initiative. The arts are important to a community. So having the empty building bothered me on that level, too. In order to have a democracy, you have to have a community. We've drawn a number of people to the Sim who hadn't been there before. And as importantly, many, many of the people who are residents have showed up and are enjoying being in the Sim and talking to each other. While community thrives in CDS, many citizens still feel that not a whole lot of decisions are left to them. The controversial adding of voice for chat by SL's corporate parents, Linden Lab, is one of them. Clearly, Linden Lab needs to make money for investors, so many choices concerning SL will be made within the corporation. But critics like Topgenosse Brower say the Lindens should relinquish more control over the world they once created. Brauer lives in Neufreistadt and champions virtual self-determination. He says that citizens will remain unhappy about Linden's god powers. He suggests that the CDS should look for more open source competitors to SL, even though switching to another platform might be nearly impossible at this point. Playing democracy is everyday life in CDS, but just like in the real world, big money from the private sector seems to gain influence. Politician Michel Manin is also a prominent developer, currently putting the finishing touches on his newest project, the Emporium Romani Superstore. For life for You News, I'm Dragster Dupre. Okay, so these were my humble beginnings. Uh, the very first machinima. And um, apart from the, you know, the stuff that I see now, the, the, the fairly crude, uh, camera movements and all that kind of technical stuff that, that um, uh, I hope I improved upon over the years. Um, there's something that I want to address which, which, which comes back to the title of this presentation, What Have I Learned? And, and what I have learned is that when you embark on, on this type of documentary, uh, there is really very little difference between real life and second life. Um, the physical world the physical realm and the virtual realm, uh, which is that it's very hard to get people to uh, trust you um, and share their stories. So that is, that is really something um, that I should have known, I guess, from uh, from doing public radio. But since we were a local channel, I worked for a local NPR station, the people actually uh, like to talk because I was part of the community there yeah um, and uh, but then again I then started to really work hard to become part of the second life community of course with the difference that the second life community uh, that, that that's almost a misnomer because it is so very fragmented and people live in their own worlds within this wonderful world 
but basically, I realized after doing this first, very first machinima, that I needed to work really hard on being inside this world uh, if I wanted to continue this successfully, um, to, to, to really live here and not just parachute in. Um, uh, it just occurred to me that I'm not talking to, to, to journalism students, but I'm talking to people who use Second Life for education. But I think a lot of that can, can, can apply. Uh, and and I'm gonna go uh, in and out of that uh, as well as I continue to uh, to talk because exactly uh, because it translates in the sense of the the crucial aspect here is to to take people very seriously um, and and make them feel that they can that they can trust you with their story so. After this uh, first machinima, you know, the, I caught the bug and I pushed out a new story every two weeks. I really don't know how I did it. To, when I look, this is one of those things when you get sucked into something, you really don't know how actually, how did you actually do this? I can tell you, I was at the swimming pool with my son and I had a pad of paper and I wrote the outline of the story. Uh, a story about conflict resolution between Palestinians and Israelis in Second Life. I wrote that uh, while my son was in the swimming pool and I had like these papers and I was writing that outline and then went back, filmed it and, and, and knocked it out really fast. I wrote a story on a plane, um, touched down, sh shot it and put it out there. It, I, I, I was so obsessed and I, I still am obsessed, but it's a little bit healthier now, I think. I remember I was on a uh, on a film set. I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I make music. I also occasionally make music for feature films. And I was on a film set with my mobile device, IMing uh, back and forth with a Second Life resident um, about uh, scheduling an interview and uh, trying to do a pre-interview and trying to convince him that he could trust me. Uh, you know, with offline IMs that go to email and. Uh, I was on that set uh, with one of the early smartphones, a, a T-Mobile Sidekick. I don't know if you guys remember that. Oh God, I'm old. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, but you know, I was texting back and forth, and everybody on that set was like, "Who is this guy texting?" And you know, where does he live? Uh, does he live in a virtual world? But uh, I was, I was on the job, and I, I took it very seriously, and I still do. But. Uh, but moving on, so I, I had the opportunity to to work with the Bay Area Video Coalition, and the next film is actually queued up. But I just realized this is a 12-minute uh, film. That is still ongoing about a feature film, 90-minute feature film for PBS that is in production right now that um, examines the lynching, the history of lynching of African Americans in the United States, a practice that um, went on uh, through the early 60s. Yes, Benji, watch that later. That's a 12-minute behind-the-scenes kind of documentary. And what this does ha have to do with Second Life is that we developed a, a concept to talk about this in Second Life, that a, a a um, multimedia, um, a multimedia component uh, that is part of this film. The film is not yet released, and Zoe says in the chat uh, that we I interviewed the filmmaker Jackie Olive on the Drax Files podcast. I forgot to mention that we have a weekly podcast um, on Fridays, and I talked to her. The, why I bring this up in this presentation is that. We spent a week trying to find out how can we use Second Life, right? And here's something that could translate, I think, to educators to educate people uh, about this horrendous part of U.S. history: the lynching, the 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 putting, killing, public killings of 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 people. Um, it's it's just unbelievable for me as a foreigner. I'm uh, uh, I'm I was not born in the U.S. I'm a study. I'm a student of U.S. history, and uh, this is a part of 
of the history that I was familiar with per, uh, on the periphery, but not to that detail that I learned while working on this film and on this project. And we were really thinking about how can we do this in Second Life. We thought about let's do role play. Let's do immersive role play. Okay, somebody plays the hench man. Somebody plays the victim. Now we were advised against that uh, for very obvious reasons. Maybe some people actually enjoy. <coughs> excuse me, got a cough, <coughs> and I don't have a cough button. Um, and enjoy really in a perverse way, possibly playing someone who kills someone else in, in that public manner, and it becomes sort of this this sport that it that it was back then. Because if you look at the historical uh, footage. It, it was a sport. There was sometimes the town was witnessing. There were postcards made um, of the victim uh, that were sent out. Uh, people writing, you know, I was there, and you know, check this out. I was really there. So people being proud of of being a part of this. The film is very much about the bystander syndrome, though, that that reverberates uh, until today, and so we. Uh, approach the Second Life component with, with that in mind. And uh, despite people advising against it, we developed a concept where you can go into an area and you can choose different to role play uh, different people within that story. So it becomes a reenactment. And uh, like I said, there were uh, people on the team, we developed this at the Bay Area Video Coalition in San Francisco, there were a few people on the team who said, you know, you guys are crazy, you're going to get all sorts of crazy people that want to kind of, you know, that get off on killing other people and then they role play that stuff. Um, but we went ahead and did it uh, because we, Jackie Olive, the director, said, you know what, there are people doing reenactments in real life and that is true. Uh, and that that is actually shown in the film and when you watch this 12 minutes of behind the scenes uh, thing from 2010 you will see that um people pl uh, role play that in real life and and it gets very uncomfortable it gets very uncomfortable when there's 20 30 people in period clothing screaming you know hang that uh, bleep and bleep up on the tree do it you know and um they actually uh, you, you gotta watch it anyway. The argument, the main argument was, we can be incredibly powerful with this medium of a virtual world to inhabit these characters for better or for worse. It will change us, and of course, and here's something that I learned while documenting this: it has to go hand in hand with other materials. Now, it depends what this is targeted to. This project is targeted to, towards a wide variety of, of groups and uh, uh, age, age groups, right? I also worked on another project that was primarily for middle school students and high school students. Um, but this one also, we developed written materials that go hand in hand with this um, project. That means people need to, needed to fill out uh, questionnaires afterwards had to write little essays how how they felt about inhabiting the quote unquote character immersing themselves into the story into the with the avatar and all that kind of stuff so uh, to wrap this story up and then move on this film is now fully funded there is a 45 minute version uh, ready to go. It's it's powerful, and I am on board uh, developing immersive um, uh, immersive projects go alongside the traditional ninety minute documentary. It's really exciting, and I spoke to Jackie yesterday. We are not sure if we're going to use Second Life um, for this, but uh, we will see. It is it is on the table as our a few other concepts. But anyway, please watch this later. This is an incredibly, incredibly powerful piece. Let's watch something uh, because, oops, sorry, no, I started my browser on accident. Now moving on, I did about, uh, over the years, about 200 or so 
machinimas, and some of them are unlisted on my uh, channel. Like I said, I was obsessed. I did a lot with teachers. I did a lot with educational uh, uh, applications. Um, but then I realized, and I did comedy. We did comedy with Fluffy, the character that we developed. Uh, these are all still on my channel. as a very different direction. And um, in 2013, um, my friend Chris Lehman approached me and said, you know, nobody's doing kind of reportage documentary anymore. You should do that again. And I said, okay, then I'll do it with you because I want to profile individuals. And it, at the time, it occurred to me that what I'm maybe best at is uh, profile individuals and tell their personal story and make it really personal. Uh, and there, and, and, and with that, uh, explain to the outsiders what Second Life can, can be. And so even if you're not into fashion, let's say, because I did a bunch of fashion-related stories, and frankly, I'm not so much into fashion. Marianne can attest to that. I mean, I'm wearing a T-shirt, uh, my cargo pants, my flip-flops uh, for a couple of years now. No, not the T-shirt. The T-shirt is new. Uh, but the point being is that the fashion related stories on my channel are also uh, I think instrumental for folks to learn what Second Life is and I heard from a lot of teachers who are showing these two students um, to explain what Second Life is. But let's watch the first one, the first Drax Files World Makers from 2013 and you can click on the um, on the board. Marianne is putting the the URL in there. I'm putting the URL in the local chat. Hey, Chris. Let me start by asking. What is it exactly you do in Second Life? I make trees. I make plants. I make fences. I make... Wait a minute. Why on earth do you make trees? I make trees because I can. <laughs> My name in Second Life is Chris Lehman. My avatar, he's this old Asian uh, gardener type of guy, like an old natural sage. Uh, doesn't wear any kind of fancy clothes. He's just got these uh, wooden sandals uh, and a cane. And he has this little squirrel friend who rides around on top of his head. I've got trees. I've got land textures. I've got this uh, sad little holiday tree made of mesh. And because I really wanted to bring something dynamic into Second Life, I made the dragonflies that move around and land. I use mostly Maya and try to marl it organically. Over the years, my style has definitely changed. Just as I learned more about how to do something that I've always painted in Photoshop, but now I can model it instead. I think it's a lot similar to, say, uh, bonsai. You're taking a natural object, but you're trying to organize it in an artistic way. I grew up on the outskirts of a uh, national forest. That's some of the best memories of growing up around trees and just the sounds of nature and everything. Actually, the oldest section of Straylight is the first forest that I built. It's still what I think of when I get homesick, the beams of light and everything. In Second Life, anything that you design and create, you can also sell. Since 2008, Second Life has been the only job I've had. I went from 60 hour weeks at my desk job to sometimes literally 20 hours a day in Second Life, but it's almost never been too overpowering. It's a lot more personal. It's not somebody writing me an email, it's somebody standing there with their avatar in front of me and I know behind that person is the woman I'm talking to.
Second Life is really strong with emotional bandwidth. Your brain doesn't really tell the difference between what happens in your screen and what happens around you. The people you meet, the places you go, those actually make real connections. The summer of 2007, I ran into my wife-to-be. We were having little parties, and Shy was there. She was being really funny, and I pulled up her profile picture, and she was beautiful. Immediately, I just, like, turn on the charm. At one point, I decided to make her a tree. Eventually, all those trees I was making ate up all the prim count I had on my entire sim. So... <laughs> I started making trees in order to flirt with Shy, and eventually it took over everything I had. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a better man for it, Chris. So uh, what's coming up in the future? Any plans? I have too many plans. I want to redesign my sim, which means I need to make probably a thousand new landscaping items just so I can landscape the new sim in the new store. Shy and I are working on a collaborative idea that we started years ago and only now have realized that we can do it. It's, it's almost everything we've been working for the entire time. In the end, you know, the people who are here the longest that have the sense of pride in what they're doing are the ones who are actually putting in their own effort building this kind of virtual world. Folks seem to be seem to be wrapping up. Um, let me see, I'm reading the chat here. Uh, people are saying that it's difficult to explain Second Life, and uh, I've said this so many times, sometimes I forget it, forget that I maybe should stress that again. The impetus behind this particular format or why I started it um, a after having done, uh, you know, reportage previously is that uh, Chris Lehman really said, you know, he's, he, he misses the kind of sort of uh, reportage or documentary um, nobody's doing it, but then obviously this format is is a lot tighter and different than what I previously did, and I'm kind of not putting myself in there as the narr narrator. It is really a first person narration of the of the protagonist, and those five minutes uh, come out of a sometimes two hour conversation. So I take this very seriously uh, in terms of pr uh, production, really old school. Uh, you know, journalism, if you will, where you really spend time digging deep. And now we can talk about uh, definitions because obviously there's a real great uh, resurgence and it's a kind of the golden age of documentary uh, that we live in now. I mean, documentary has always been around, but there is um, such sort of plethora of do documentaries out there, I'm talking about more long form, that are b balancing the obsession with the now. Right, so uh, I'm a news junkie, and it's important to know what's going on now. But if we don't have any context, uh, then it's just completely useless, basically. So uh, that's why I love documentary. I love to watch long-form documentary, and I'm trying to add my little two cents, basically, to the format, to the form, to the art form uh, here in Second Life that maybe cumulative cumulatively, sorry, my English, uh, over time, maybe a m mosaic emerges uh, where people can go back and go like, you know what, this is really a very diverse world and this is how people felt about it and maybe uh, when they put that mosaic together, they they come out uh, feeling, you know, this is, this is giving me a clear picture. They might also come out <laughs> saying, wow, Drexter is really kind of like a propaganda minister of Second Life because everybody says the same thing. Second Life is so great and it's so great and there's absolutely no critical uh, ounce in, in, in any of these films. So uh, let me just say, and this is not, I'm not saying this defensively because there's nothing to defend. I'm an, um, thank you, Cami, an evangelist. I'm an advocate. This is advocacy journalism. Um, and uh, I chose to spend my time that way. This is a this is a hobby, uh, a hobby in the sense that I'm not getting paid, other than a little 
uh, sponsorship by Linden Lab. Linden Lab has an incentive that this is going going uh, forward because they can use it as promotion. But I have a great contract with them where I have final cut. I can choose the subject matter and I can present it any which way. Uh, but anyways, I'm 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 slightly uh, off a tangent here. The point is, what what have I learned in my learning uh, over time? And I read uh, earlier in the chat that uh, I don't know who said that, that it's amazing to see my progress. And this is something that I did learn and that I do want to pass on, um, which Second Life taught me something that I should have known at the age I entered Second Life is that don't be afraid to try new things. Um, but Second Life, I think, is unique in facilitating that for many, many reasons. Uh, but one is you can sort of dabble in things and you can fail um, and you can try again and, and, and all that sort of thing. So I'm certainly not um, a professional filmmaker, or I wasn't. I mean, now uh, I was encouraged to actually put that on my resume and actually introduce myself uh, with that description. But when I started, I had no uh, background in filmmaking of any kind, other than maybe some home movies. So um, now I'm going to say something slightly critical uh, uh, of educators. We're going to watch another one uh, with uh, an educational focus, and then I'm going to say something that maybe that may sound harsh. Uh, but it's the truth that I, as I see it in terms of educational uses of Second Life as they stand today. Um, but it's a cliffhanger. I'm going to tell you guys that after we watch the next uh, film. And the next film, uh, some of you may have seen it, is um, about teaching chemistry in Second Life. Uh, Marianne, if you could put this into the, into the projection screen, I'll give you a little time. Uh, thank you for, for working here. Uh, with with me. Um, this is a, uh, a portrait, and, and by the way, oh yeah, I, I need to say this as well. Um, the key to, the reason why I'm doing this, I said this, is, is for us to to have something where we can explain what Second Life is. So, so it's like this little gift that I'm giving the community where they can convince others that we're not all crazy and that th those others, they may be colleagues, they may be family members, um, but oftentimes, as it was pointed out, it's very difficult to explain, and that's the attempt that I'm doing. Now, the next one that we're going to watch is episode 19 of the series about teaching chemistry, Texas A&M University. It's very successful using Second Life in the uh, Chemistry 101 course, and uh, this is a profile of uh, Wendy. Who is teaching? My name in Second Life is Julia Taraxabar. I teach chemistry at Texas A&M University. And let me guess, the students who are required to take your course find it rather annoying that they must complete a component in Second Life, right? No. As a matter of fact, our current study clearly indicates that students using Second Life in the laboratory not only enjoy class much more than the real-world control group, the Second Life learners seem to have better retention as well. I'm dying to learn how you do it, so let's reveal your bag of tricks right after the title sequence. Specifically with chemistry, Second Life is an amazing thing. So much of chemistry is based on shapes of molecules and understanding the 3D nature. You can walk around the molecule, you can sit on the molecule. I have interactive periodic tables. You have your friend with you, and your friend doesn't have to be sitting next to you looking at the screen. Your friend could be at home, you're at school, you come in together, you build together. That's important for the learning process, going into the process together making more neural connections because it's hitting you on so many different levels. The 
modeling programs that you buy are much more advanced than what I need in general chemistry. And Second Life is free. We're just talking about understanding a tetrahedron from a trigonal planar, octahedral, basic, valence shell, electron pair repulsion theory kinds of models. Well, Julia, I, I'm afraid you totally lost me. Oh, I'm sorry. I gotta brush up on my high school chemistry. In the meantime, let's talk about the NSF grant. What is it all about? This is a National Science Foundation educational grant. Students were taking laboratory. We recreated two of the labs in Second Life. The rest of the students are our controls. They're doing the real lab in the real world. The Second Life students work on lab platforms in the sky, trying to figure out the molecular weight of butane gas in a regular butane lighter. They have to use a balance. They have to weigh it before and after. They are collecting gas. And in Second Life, they can actually see the bubbles of gas coming out and being collected in an overturned graduated cylinder. They have to measure the air pressure, the air temperature. The behavior of the students in Second Life is remarkably like the way the students would be in the real lab. What we found is that the Second Life people like their Second Life labs better than the real life people like their real life labs. Time and time again, students said they were much more able to focus on what they were doing in Second Life rather than the chaos of a real lab. There was less distraction. They could read their graduated cylinders and their burettes to the correct number of sig figs significantly better than the students who did it in the real lab. Their data came out better. So now that Kurt Winkleman, my co-investigator, and I are halfway through the study, we can also say that the kinesthetic ability, the ability to remember how to handle the equipment, was almost on par in Second Life as in the real lab. Fascinating indeed. But uh, how would you approach other educators who may feel intimidated by digital technology, maybe find SL not appropriate for learning at all? Well, I would. And as a matter of fact, I have given tours to educators and graduate students, and that can really change minds. The environment is so rich. There are so many places, art, architecture, language. And everything in here is made by regular people, just like you and me. Not everyone is necessarily a trained professional in programming or design, but what does it matter? When I talk to my students, I'd say up front, it's just like the web. You got places where you might be uncomfortable going, and then you have all this informational stuff. Same like if you're going to New York City. And my students all understood that. And where students go, educators hopefully will follow. Slight foot and mouth disease, <laughs> occasionally. I've been told. Uh, so I hope this is not uh, going to be misunderstood. I am the biggest advocate for education in virtual ver worlds, second, li second life primarily, uh, that you could imagine. I mean, I'm the Energizer Bunny running around how awesome it is. And I'm still doing that, although uh, arguably a lot of uh, educators are, are, I don't know, disgruntled because of this or that. I've been running around in my son's middle school. Um, I've worked with uh, Santa Clara University on tons of stuff. Uh, some, some very specific things back in 2008. Um, but here's the problem. Um, and Lauren, uh, it's great that you're here because here's here's what I see as the problem. Uh, what's been point, pointed out as a problem, why educational projects don't really take off, uh, I partially agree with, but I don't think it's the only problem. So what I always hear is that, oh my God, look at the educators. They're, re, they're, they're in a virtual world where you can do anything. Yeah, you can be a dragon. Um, uh, a dragon dancing with a flying toaster oven in a volcano 
And what are they doing? They're replicating the real life classroom so kids can sit down. Uh, that's not how education works. That's not how we learn. Um, we, we learn in immersive en environments by immersing ourselves into the subject matter. If that is uh, building a Japanese village uh, to go there and talk about Japan or being in a war zone and, and maybe shooting at each other or uh, doing this and doing that. So there's, there's, there's plenty of great stuff. Uh, don't have to point out 1920s Berlin as a community that is, that is inherently educational, even if that might not be the primary uh, uh, reason why Joe started it. Um, but that's, uh, you know, it can be used that way. All right, so, so the problem though is and like I said, I, you hear this, you hear this often, time and again. Like, okay, you got this awesome environment, and people use it for the really kind of pedestrian, in pedestrian ways. And of course, then, a stuff doesn't work because it's just boring. Uh, and B, uh, uh, related to A, is that that kids these days <laughs> with their Twitter, uh, kids are very spoiled when it comes to visual fidelity. Um, and other things. Now, B, which is related to A, and let me expand on that, is actually the reason why I think things don't work. And here's the disconnect. The disconnect is, as it often happens in the physical world, there is a disconnect between the magnificent ideas that, that a lot of forward-thinking educators, in whatever realm they work, K through 12, adult education, whatnot, they may have awesome ideas, but they don't have the skills. I don't have any buildings. And let me tell you, I speak from experience. Thank you, Marianne, that you're here. I can't build a three-legged chair. I have Marianne and other people when I have uh, ideas for my series where we have to visualize certain things that are not existing. Um, I have a team of people that brainstorm with me and we come up with ideas together to visualize the points that are being made and we utilize often sort of the latest that is available in Second Life. Second Life has a lot of stuff available. Let me just throw out experience keys, right? Game mechanics, they're quite sophisticated. Mesh, it's been around since 2011. Uh, Project Bento is still on the beta grid, but it's going to be live here too, where you have incredibly sophisticated avatars. Now, the problem is, some educators may not even be aware of the stuff that's going on, that Linden Lab is adding those features that are just amazing, especially the experience key features, the game mechanics. Uh, some educators may be aware that they exist, but the problem is that the skills and the time to learn these skills are not there. Now, of course, we have uh, amazing builders in Second Life. We have people who have those skills. Right? So we have artists, we have scripters, but they are in short supply. And Lauren, because you mentioned this early, and Lauren uh, worked with Matt P on a bunch of things. Um, Matt P is, of course, just one example of, pe of a group of people who are very skilled and very sort of up to the minute uh, knowledge of what Linden Lab is pushing out and the functionality that is available in Second Life. Educators don't have those skills necessarily, not because they're stupid, but because they just don't have them like I can't build. Okay, so, but the frustrating thing is that these two uh, worlds, in my mind, they need to merge. That's what I learned. That's what I learned in nine years documenting Second Life, that there is a fragmentation that is really bad for the overall image uh, of Second Life out there too because when you want to prove as an educator that Second Life is the medium to do immersive education and you show them the replica of a classroom built that it looks like 2006 it's not going to uh, win over hearts and minds of anyone let alone the student um, and I'm not saying that I'm addressing an audience of uh, folks that are doing this. I'm just saying that I, der I uh, derived a 
really high level of frustration by realizing that I have no solution for this problem. Because one could think of sort of a matchmaking service or whatnot, right? So I, I would volunteer to be the matchmaker between educators who have great ideas and I, I match them up with uh, with the builders and the scripters who can execute these ideas and I've done that on, on occasion successfully but why was I able to do this successfully for the simple reason that the builders and scripters of, of that technical uh, degree that they could execute stuff that is really cool they are busy and it's not that they are expensive. They are incredibly busy with their own stuff because they see the opportunity. Let me give you a, a, a quick example here. And I'm, I'm going on this diatribe, but I think this is an extremely important point And we all need to think about a solution because if we're all passionate about Second Life and to also promote Second Life, to the uninitiated by way of producing content and events and projects that are really, really cutting edge, right? And uh, like I said, when Experience Keys came out um, last year, two, three people that I knew built something uh, with that the next week. One of them is Loki Elliott, my friend from the UK. He built a Halloween experience that was just absolutely amazing. It was on par with any type of console game with voice embedded in it, uh, completely steered without any typing, just with clicking. You could even do this uh, with an Oculus. There was no lag because he's a very efficient builder. Now Loki is someone who has time available and he's not motivated by money either. But you know what? He values his time that he would never Unfortunately, <laughs> he would never work for someone else because he is so full of ideas. And that's the dilemma. And like I said, I have no solution for this mismatch. I have no solution for how do we get people with ideas and passion in the educational sector to, um, to find people with the skills um, to make their dreams a reality uh, yeah so that's that's my my big point um, that I derived from and, and, and like I said I come from a place where I am constantly constantly talking about possibilities to people to the uninitiated out there if I run across them in the park uh, and Equally, I have been trying to pursue educational ideas for the Drax Files World Maker series. But to be quite honest with you, a lot of stuff doesn't translate into this format. And that is doesn't mean um, that this is mediocre in terms of execution even. Uh, it might be something that works really well, but for a visual storyteller, within this format it doesn't work it would work maybe on radio or some other format but this it, this is a real dilemma for me so I'm, I'm ending on a on a, uh, on a depressive note depressing uh, uh, oh my dog here yeah, my dog gives me the cue but but I want to go to uh, to some questions please now type questions here and I'm reading from Cami Rembrandt which you wrote here in the chat I came into SL as a postgrad student in e-learning pedagogy back in 2010 we were 26 in that class it was the only who kept using SL and other virtual worlds most of my colleagues just hated the experience because of technical issues but also lack of immersion and so yeah Kami I think this is kind of what I'm talking about uh, the technical issues aside I mean there's always technical issues um, and still to this day I mean as, as we all know as Second Life enthusiasts Second Life has improved a lot uh, there is still some issues but the lack of immersion, and I think there there are ideas out there uh, that can be done, and 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 you know I I, I I I don't mean to say that there is no worthwhile educational project in Second Life right now. That that is not the case. Actually, the next series will be uh, about nonprofit comments coming out at the end of this month, and there's a bunch of examples 
where it is used uh, successfully in the classroom. It depends on a case-by-case -case basis. My overarching point is everyone here, please find that enthusiastic scripter, <laughs> that builder, uh, and, and, and feed them cookies, uh, kidnap them. <laughs> Don't do anything illegal, but 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 somehow you know uh, get someone on, on there that can that can keep you completely up to date with the functionalities that's happening. Uh, I want to say to Cami earlier again the lack of immersion. One thing that comes to my mind is um, how to circumvent that is when you're in the class, make it a playful thing have people give them some money give them some lindens and send them out give them time to go shopping and create their avatar and really make that the first order of things uh, and i think that then that's halfway towards the immersion and then completely irrespective of what the what the purpose of your class is have them interview each other in character make little movies okay Good point. You don't even need money, but I would put out money a little bit because that economic activity is always a little exhilarating. Um, gives you some, gives you some uh, agency over over that that spending, and then have group them up in two and make them uh, act in quote unquote character. And give little interviews. Put that together. I'm reading through the other stuff. Can I post a presentation? Please do. Um, Winchell, this is awesome. Oh, languagelab.com. Yeah, see, this is this is a this is a good uh, use case. It's a, it's a that's a fabulous way of using Second Life. Um, let me read through this other stuff here. Uh, learning. Are there any other questions? Type in questions, please. Uh, would love to answer them. Um, I was gonna say that the, the the learning curve. Yeah, you have to do um, a little a little introduction, of course. But again, the point is to make it to make it more engaging and, and more fun. And I think that comes by going to Yubelina's art exhibits, for example, or others, and uh, and play around with stuff and and create avatars. Gentle is very quiet here today. Uh, gentle, what do you have to say to my uh, to my uh, philosophy here? Um, yeah, the interviews, you know, is a no-brainer for me. I don't understand why nobody ever thought of it. And, and you could do it uh, in an interview setting. You could you could uh, be very playful with it. One person is maybe the reporter, the other one is the subject, and you create a backstory and you you create it on the set. You know, Second Life is a huge world. You don't have to sit in a chair doing this interview. You can go on location and and, and you can uh, fly around and uh, you know whatnot. You know, um, and then you have multiple things happening at the same time. You, you you teach uh, the technical skills of how do I film this, how do I edit it, how do I do that workflow uh, in an efficient manner, but also um, how how you know how do I playfully engage with this? I, I, I let go. I create an avatar as an alter ego. It doesn't have to be me a hundred percent. Maybe maybe it's me like ninety percent, or maybe just five percent. Maybe it's somebody completely different. So. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, but gentle. How do you do that immersion, right? Uh, what what does that mean? Immerse themselves. Uh, and to me, um, Benji makes a great point. He's <laughs> and and see and with Benji, you see already uh, in his expression of the avatar. Uh, and again, I'm not I'm not going to knock any humanoids here. Um, Gentle knows what she's Ooh. talking about. No, don't tell me that now. <laughs> Gentle, I actually have a uh, a meeting with a, a mutual friend who needs to be um, who needs to be reminded uh, 
to do something about the login to live film. Okay, guys, I gotta, I gotta run. If anybody wants to watch um, a fabulous documentary that stars uh, Gentle Heron, I am me privately, and I'll send you the link because it's unlisted, because it's slightly illegal uh, that this is on my channel. <laughs> but I don't care. I'm challenging YouTube. Shifty eyes. <laughs> thank you guys and thank you Marianne and thank you uh, my team um, yeah I wish to stick around but I I really gotta You're go welcome. on the dot it's Marianne don't speak while I'm talking oh, that's very rude uh, <laughs> I, I want to encourage you I'm gonna I'm gonna send out the login to live link uh, one one episode that I ha had queued up here um, that that has uh, an important educational message is episode 10 if you haven't seen it with Robin Sojourner because uh, Robin also talks about something that is very important uh, which is that we are not conditioned to believe that there's a difference between a, an artist and a non-artist a, a, a creator and a non-creator uh, we're all creators and then sort of through Obviously, you know that as, as educators, there's a multitude of factors that uh, contribute to, to us sort of labeling and self-labeling. And it might be the peers that are more talented. might be a teacher who says, well, you are not good at that. might be a parent. Um, and it's, it's complex. There's no one peer group or, or, or event to blame why some people pursue creative endeavor, no matter what it is. Right, I'm talking about uh, by creative endeavor. I I, I include uh, you know playing piano concertos on the upper end level to um, gardening. Let's say just planting things. See now I said upper level makes me an elitist. I'm I'm actually saying that deriving happiness from making things versus just consuming things. Every single thing that has ever happened in Second Life, people have yelled, it's the end of Second Life as we know it. And in fact, it is, because it keeps getting better. My name in Second Life is Robin Sojourner. I do a little bit of everything. Creation, I teach, I mostly stick in my workroom, <laughs> which is not probably a good thing, but there you go. Avatar looks the way I looked 30 years ago. I don't think of my avatar as me. I think of me as me. Part of the reason that I started in Second Life was because I wound up with fibromyalgia. I had always been painting before I did book covers and magazine covers. I had to stop because it hurt too much. I realized I was living from pain pill to pain pill and I don't want to live that way. I needed to do something where I could work with my arms supported. When you're painting, you have your arms up. I had to keep creating. I can't not create. Doing the small motions in the world with my arms supported was something I could do. Every single thing that has ever happened in Second Life, people have yelled, it's the end of Second Life as we know it. And in fact, it is, because it keeps getting better. My name in Second Life is Robin Sojourner. I do a little bit of everything. Creation, I teach, I mostly stick in my workroom, <laughs> which is not probably a good thing, but there you go. Avatar looks the way I looked 30 years ago. I don't think of my avatar as me. I think of me as me. Part of the
the reason that I started in Second Life was because I wound up with fibromyalgia. I had always been painting before I did book covers and magazine covers. I had to stop because it hurt too much. I realized I was living from pain pill to pain pill and I don't want to live that way. I needed to do something where I could work with my arms supported. When you're painting, you have your arms up. I had to keep creating. I can't not create. Doing the small motions in the world with my arms supported was something I could do. I've been working in 3D graphics, um, well, since 89, so it's what, 23 years or something like that? that we have have changed hugely and so the look of the world has changed enormously. I mean with mesh it's a completely new thing. Yesterday, I was making a stool with a quilt draped over it, which came out to the equivalent of one prim, and thought about the first one prim chair that I made in 2004, and the difference is huge. One of the things that has always excited me about Second Life is that people who have no idea that they are creative come into Second Life and find out that they can make things. We are all taught at some point, generally early, that creativity is something that's reserved for the creative types and they are special and there are only a few of them and blah, 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 and it's just not true. All of us can do this. I think that the drive to be creative is there in everyone. You see it in small children. I used to teach school. And eventually they would edit it out because they didn't think that they were good at it. And people don't want to do things that they don't perceive themselves as being good at because there's this huge push to be successful in everything we do, which is ridiculous because you can't be successful in everything and you will never become good at something if you don't fail a whole lot of times first. I show people my art that I did when I was in my teens to encourage them. To me, it looks really bad. Other people say it looks okay, but the point is when students look at it, they say, oh, well, if she started there and wound up where she wound up, then there's hope for me. Robin, time flies when you share your wisdom. Thank you so much. Now, in closing, your thoughts on the stereotype that Second Life users are couch potatoes and they should rather go outside and smell the flowers. When people say stuff like that, does it drive you nuts? Yes. False dichotomies make me crazy. There is no dichotomy. I can go out and smell the flowers, but if I spend all day outside smelling the flowers, I'm going to get a horrible sunburn. You need to have balance in your life. When I'm designing a quilt, I design it in a program called Electric Quilt, and I can take those digital images from Electric Quilt and make them into quilts in Second Life, and I can also use that to sew a real quilt from. I really enjoy sewing. I enjoy having something that I can hold in my hands, but I also enjoy things that I can see. I don't think that there is as much difference between virtual stuff and real stuff as people seem to think that there is. Emotionally, there is not any difference between doing stuff in real life and doing stuff in Second Life. It hits you emotionally in exactly the same place. makes these great points in this episode um, and so that that's something that that, that cannot be overemphasized and this is something that Second Life brings back in many ways the kind that kind of openness uh, and the possibility that we can all be at the table because I do believe this is how I'm gonna finish um, I do believe that the world would be a much better place if we uh, would learn how to derive sustained happiness from from making things you know and maybe when the robots take over everything anyways uh, and 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 smart politicians will actually institute uh, the, the um, uh, 
guaranteed uh, basic income, which I think is a marvelous idea, and is, I, frankly, it's the only idea that would really work when when the robots do take over. Uh, then we actually would be able to spend time uh, doing quite meaningful things when we're not. Right, I think actually in Finland it, it passed to some extent, and in Germany they're discussing it as well. Um, you know, you, you, you can talk about this ad nauseum, and my former neighbor uh, in California had a bumper sticker that says, you don't redistribute wealth, you earn it. Um, nice guy, though, but frankly, it's just stupid. Uh, that's a stupid phrase, because there... The reality is just different. Uh, there will not be a possibility to to earn wealth for most people, um, and that doesn't have to mean that's the end. It could actually mean the beginning. It could mean a decoupling uh, of one from the other, and maybe that's maybe that's moving forward. Uh, we could we could make this a very meaningful thing, and and in a in a way, Second Life teaches us that, or re or kind of re-educates us. All right, now I said I gotta go. Now I'm keep talking. Marianne knows what that is like. All right. Uh, I'm gonna send out the link to log into life, and thanks every everybody, and uh, I will continue. Thank you. Okay. Good good luck, and keep me posted on any educational project. I hope I uh, I inspired you guys. Uh, himself sometimes sad I'm not now going to go and weep offline no <laughs> I'll be back okay bye